Okay, so first I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, about folks that are on uh, the newest material that you guys have been covered, so eigenvalues and conductors. I want to recall the um, definition of a So the IJ may be uh, Yes, I am cutting out. Hmm. Uh, okay, so let's try that again. Okay. So seems okay right now. All right, so yeah, um, definitely let me know if um, I'm cutting out again, okay? Okay, so I wanted to start by recalling the uh, definition of a cofactor. So the IJ cofactor of a matrix A uh, which I often denote as like C I J for like for the I J cofactor. So this was equal to negative one to a power of I plus J times the determinant of the matrix that you get. By removing the Uh, I throw and the Jth column of matrix A. Okay. And using the cofactors was one way of computing the determinant of a matrix. So you could compute the determinant of the matrix A by. Uh, picking any row or any column and so let's say if you pick the ith row what you can do is uh, take each entry in the ith row so ith row first column take each entry and multiply with its cofactor and then just add everything up after that. And then you could also do it along any column as well. Okay. So you could also compute the determinant by taking each entry in the jth column. So let's say first row jth column A1J and then times the corresponding cofactor and so forth. And no matter which row or column you choose, uh, you will always end up with the same answer and that will be the determinant of A. Okay. So I wanted to talk about one application of all of this. which is uh, there is a formula for computing the inverse of a matrix in terms of its cofactors. So 
So earlier in the semester, we did learn how to compute the inverse of a matrix. Uh, what you had to do was take your matrix A, augment it with an identity matrix, and then you had to do this really long procedure of um, like gauss jordan and you had to reduce until you had identity on the left and then whatever you had on the right would have been the inverse okay uh, well now we uh, also have like a formula that you can use for getting the inverse of a matrix so here's how the formula works so let's let's see the the uh, matrix of cofactors of A. Okay. So in other words, the uh, entries of C would be the 1-1 one, one cofactor, the 1-2 cofactor, and so forth. And then the uh, second row, first column, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so if you can all the cofactors of A and put them into a matrix C, then it turns out, which I'm not gonna, well, I'm not gonna prove it, but it turns out that if you take the matrix A and you multiply it with its cofactor matrix, uh, whether you do A times C or C times A, this product is going to equal the determinant of A uh, times the identity matrix, okay? And so if the determinant of A is non-zero, then we can divide uh, each part of this equation by the determinant of A. So you get, uh, let's see here, I'll write it like this, A times, I'm gonna do one over the determinant of A. Uh, I'm gonna group it with the matrix C here. Oh, whoops, sorry, that should be C transpose, by the way, it's my bad. Okay. So I'm going to group the uh, one over the determinant with the matrix C transpose. So you get that like this will be equal to the identity matrix after dividing by A, okay? And since A times this matrix equals the identity, uh, that tells you that this must have been the inverse of A, okay? So in other words, we have this formula that A inverse is one over determinant of A, and then times the transpose of the cofactor matrix. Okay. And so I would like to just do like one example of this. So here I'm going to write down a three by three matrix. Okay. And let's say for this three by three matrix, I want to uh, first let's find its inverse uh, using this uh, cofactor formula. All right, so to do that, we have to compute uh, all of the cofactors of A first in order to get the cofactor matrix. Okay, so let's see. Um, uh, let's get the one one cofactor first. So I'm going to cross out the first row in the first column. So that leaves me with this two by two matrix. So its determinant would be um, one minus zero. So the first cofactor will be one, okay? 
Uh, before I continue, uh, remember that for the cofactors, uh, it'll be plus or minus um, in the front, and you can determine the sign by looking at this uh, picture. Uh, so then, like for instance, for the second co, for the one two cofactor here, but cross out the first row in the second column. The remaining two by two determinant would be one minus zero, so it's one. But then I'll put an extra negative in front because that was the one two cofactor. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to continue computing all the cofactors. Uh, let me know if you guys have any questions, okay? So I'm going to get the 1, 3 cofactor next. So cross out the first row and the third column. And then the remaining 2 by 2 determinant is negative 2 minus a negative 1. So that would be negative 1, okay? Next for the 2, 1 cofactor. So cross out the second row in the first column. The remaining two by two determinant would be negative one plus two, so it's plus one. But then I'm gonna put an extra minus in front. So it's gonna become minus one. And then the T2 cofactor, so cross out the second row and second column. I'm gonna get one plus one that's going to be two. And then second row, third column, the remaining two by two determinant is negative two minus one, so negative three. But then I'm going to change the sign for the uh, two, three cofactor here. So become positive three. And finally, crossing out third row and first column. Here we get zero minus one. Next, we're gonna get zero minus one again, and then change the sign to make it positive one. And finally, uh, cross out the third row and the third column. So the determinant would be one plus one, so two, okay? All right, so I hope I did that right. If you guys caught any mistakes, uh, let me know, okay? Okay, so we've got the matrix of cofactors. So we'll want to transpose it, but we're also gonna need the determinant of A as well. So to get the determinant of A, uh, let's take the, uh, I'll take the third column because I see a zero in it. So if I take each entry in the uh, third column and multiply by the corresponding cofactors, so negative one times negative one, plus uh, zero times three, and then plus negative one times two. Okay. All right, so let's see here, that's gonna be one minus two, so the determinant of A was negative one. So then with that, uh, we can compute the inverse as being one over the determinant of A, so one over negative one, and then times the transpose of C. So transposing C is gonna be one minus one minus one for the first row. Negative one, two, one for the second row. And then one, negative three, and negative Sorry, negative one, two for the third row. And if I distribute the negative one into the matrix, 
Then we're going to get uh, for the A inverse, negative 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, negative 2, negative 1, negative 3, and negative 2. OK? All right, so any questions about that? All right. So then uh, I think that's uh, all I'll say. Uh, so maybe I'll make a quick comment about the formula. So I guess like why is the formula useful? Uh, so first off, um, Sometimes when you're working like more like theoretically, and then it's useful to actually have a formula for the inverse. Uh, so that's one reason why it's nice. Another reason why the formula is nice, it kind of gives you some information about the process of inverting a matrix. So from this formula, one thing that you can kind of infer is that uh, all the entries of A inverse, all the entries of A inverse are, uh, I guess, uh, determinants of like various like sub matrices of the matrix A. And when you're computing the determinant of a matrix, when you think of it as a function of all the entries of the matrix, it's basically a polynomial. So since like a polynomial is a continuous, uh, for instance, then it tells you that the process of inverting a matrix is also continuous. So like uh, if you have a matrix which is like, and you change the numbers slightly, uh, the inverse of the matrix uh, will also only change slightly when that happens. So that's kind of interesting for uh, if you're thinking about like um like the stability of like and the process of inverting a matrix. So uh, yeah, you get some nice information from this formula, okay? Uh, but I, th I think that's all that I'm going to say about it. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about the uh, main topic for today, which would be uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, so let's give a definition of everything first, okay? Now, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, these are only defined for square matrices, uh, kind of like determinants, okay? So let's suppose I have a square matrix A. So let's say it is size uh, N by N. All right, so a, a scalar lambda is said to be an I value of A, the matrix A, uh, if there exists a non-zero vector uh, x such that a times x is equal to lambda times x, OK? So that is the definition of an eigenvalue. And then any uh, non-zero vector x 
uh, satisfying this equation. Uh, is said to be an eigenvector of A, okay, uh, corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda, okay. So those are definitions of uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So in my next review, uh, which will be next Monday, uh, we'll talk about one of the like applications of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So namely, they come into play in like a special sort of uh, factorization or like decomposition of a matrix. So earlier in the semester, we talked about things like the LU factorization and whatnot. So eigenvalues and eigenvectors are going to lead to another uh, kind of factorization for matrices, uh, which uh, also has its various applications. Uh, for now, let's focus on uh, how to find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors uh, of a given matrix. Uh, and actually, let's see here, before that, let me make one more comment about the definitions. Okay, so notice that in the definition of an eigenvalue, uh, we do emphasize that the vector x needs to be a non-zero vector. So just a quick comment about why we need x to be non-zero. Well, if x were equal to zero, then like, any number lambda would satisfy this equation when x is zero. So in order to get like something meaningful, um, this is only meaningful when x is uh, non-zero. So that's why we make that specification in the definition, okay? Okay, so let's talk about how to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So here is the equation that we have in the definition of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Here I'll emphasize x being non-zero. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do with this equation. So I'm going to rearrange it a little bit. So I'm going to move the ax over to the other side. So we will get a zero equals lambda x minus a x. Uh, and then it's not a big deal, but I'm just gonna switch that up. So I'm going to write this over on the left now, just because usually I like to see that this stuff on the left, and then we have it equal to zero, okay? Okay. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to factor an x out from both sides of this equation. Now when we factor out an x from uh, both of these terms, so it kind of looks like you're going to be left with uh, lambda minus a. But uh, that's actually not the case. So the reason why that doesn't quite work is because remember that lambda, the eigenvalue is a scalar, whereas A is a matrix. So scalar minus a matrix does not make sense. So uh, in order to make this work, when we factor out the X from both terms, we have to insert an identity matrix over here. Uh, so that that way we'd have a matrix minus a matrix, and that makes sense. And if you were to distribute the x back into the parentheses, 
remember that ix is equal to x. So you end up getting lambda x minus ax once you distribute it back, OK? All right, so I want to take a closer look at uh, what we have in this equation here, OK? All right, so first we have that um, the eigenvector x is a solution to this equation here, lambda i minus ax equals 0. And remember that solutions to this equation constitute the null space of your matrix. So that's when you're solving the equation like equals 0. So that's the first thing that we see is that the eigenvectors Are, are going to form the null space of the matrix lambda i minus a. Okay. So all of that work that we've done before of finding like uh, null spaces of matrices. That's all going to come back into play here, because finding the null space of the matrices lambda i minus a are how we're going to find the eigenvectors. Okay. Now we do need a we do need the eigenvalue lambda though, in order to do this step. So now there's a question of how to find the eigenvalues. So let's think a little bit about what's going on here. So we're saying that there is a non-zero solution uh, to this uh, like homogeneous equation for lambda i minus a. So among other things, so what does it mean to have a non-zero solution to this equation? Uh, so that means a lot of things, but one of the things that it means is that this matrix lambda i minus a uh, must have been singular or not invertible, OK? Ah, yes, of course. Um, it does not. All right, so let's see here. Uh, so instead of minusing ax over to here, so that it's uh, lambda x minus ax, uh, certainly we could have minus lambda x instead. So you would have gotten like ax minus lambda x is 0. Uh, so no, there's nothing wrong with doing it this way. Uh, but uh, yeah, I will point out in one of my examples later why I prefer this way instead, though, OK? Uh, but no, you'll get the same eigenvalues and eigenvectors no matter how you do it, so it doesn't matter. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, so something I was saying is, to have a non-zero solution to this equation, uh, one consequence or one implication of that is that the matrix lambda i minus a must be singular or non-invertible. And we know that for a matrix to be non-invertible, uh, its determinant must be equal to 0. OK. So this equation here, determinant of lambda i minus a equals 0, uh, we call this equation the characteristic equation.
Don't know how important that is, but if you hear that phrase, that's what it's referring to. And what we see is that the eigenvalues are going to be the solutions uh, to the characteristic equation. So in other words, the eigenvalues are going to be the numbers lambda that will satisfy this equation. So this gives us a, a way of finding the eigenvalues now. So the eigenvalues are going to be the solutions to the characteristic equation here. OK. So with these two pieces of information, I'm now basically going to do a bunch of examples of uh, calculating eigenvalues and eigenvectors for uh, various matrices. Uh, so let's start off a little bit simple. So we'll start with the two by two matrix first. Okay. So for this matrix A, we want to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, we are going to start by uh, computing the determinant of lambda i minus a in order to begin finding the eigenvalues. Once we find the eigenvalues, we'll compute the null space of lambda i minus a for each eigenvalue uh, to get the eigenvectors, all right? So that's going to be the strategy. Uh, maybe one piece of uh, one more piece of terminology. So the null space of lambda i minus a uh, so sometimes I hear people refer to it as an eigenspace. Uh, maybe eigenspace uh, corresponding to lambda. Uh, so I guess the reason why they call it eigenspace is because it is a space of eigenvectors. So eigenspace, okay? So I, I, sometimes I use that terminology myself. So if you hear it, uh, that is what I am referring to. All right, so here's the first step to the problem. So I'm gonna compute uh, lambda i minus a. Uh, remember that identity is just matrix with ones on the diagonal. But since I'm multiplying by lambda, that means it's going to have lambda on the diagonal and then zero everywhere else. So that's lambda i. I'm going to subtract a from it. And so that's going to leave us with lambda minus one, zero minus two, so negative two, negative two, and then lambda minus one. Okay, so that is lambda i minus a. So what I need to do next is I need to compute the determinant of lambda i minus a. So we're gonna do that next. So that means we need the determinant of this two by two matrix here. And so for a two by two matrix, the determinant is A times D. 
and then minus b times c. So it's going to be minus 4. Okay, so that's the determinant of lambda i minus a. So we're going to set it equal to 0 now. And we're going to solve for lambda now that we've set it equal to 0. So in this case, I can solve for lambda by adding 4 to the other side. So lambda minus 1 squared must equal 4. And then if we square root both sides, uh, we get that lambda minus 1 must equal plus or minus 2. All right, so if lambda minus 1 is equal to 2, then that will give us lambda equals 3. Uh, the other possibility is if lambda minus 1 equals negative 2, then adding 1 over, we get the other eigenvalue to be negative 1. Okay. So that is how you get the eigenvalues of a matrix. Okay. So let's recap the procedure real quickly. You uh, set up the matrix lambda i minus a. You compute its determinant. Then you set it equal to 0 and solve for lambda to get the eigenvalues. So remember that the eigenvalues were the solutions to this equation. And so that's why we are solving it to get the eigenvalues. Now a little bit more terminology here before I continue with the problem. So notice that when you compute the determinant of lambda i minus a, the result is going to be a polynomial in lambda. So that will always be the case. For a 2 by 2 matrix, uh, it's going to be a quadratic polynomial. For a 3 by 3 matrix, it'll be a cubic polynomial, uh, etc. So this polynomial that we get, uh, some people will call it the uh, characteristic polynomial. Okay. So in general, whatever determinant of lambda i minus a is, uh, that would be the characteristic polynomial of a. So you could say that the eigenvalues are the roots or the zeros of the characteristic polynomial. Okay. Uh, all right, so we have the eigenvalues. So now uh, we want to get the eigenvectors next. So remember that to get the eigenvectors, so we get them by uh, looking at the null space. of lambda i minus a. So let's start with our first eigenvalue, lambda equals 3. OK, so. When lambda equals 3, so I'm going to plug in 3 for lambda, so 3i minus a. Okay. Now I can just plug in 3 for lambda into this matrix to get the results. So plugging in 3 for lambda will give us 2 
negative 2, negative 2, 2. Okay, and so we want to find the null space of this matrix. So if you remember how to find the null space of a matrix, what you want to do is you want to reduce your matrix into at least a row echelon form. Uh, it is often easier, in my opinion, if you reduce all the way to the reduced row echelon form, OK? So if we start by reducing this matrix, uh, row 2 plus row 1 immediately gives us a row zeros. And before I continue, just a comment. So you should always get at least one row of zeros. When you are finding the eigenvectors, Reason is because uh, remember that lambda i minus a is supposed to be not invertible uh, because its determinant is equal to zero when lambda is an eigenvalue. So if it's not invertible, you should always get a row zeros then when you do your row operations, OK? So sometimes I see a student trying to find the eigenvectors and they're having a problem because uh, they have like full pivots when they reduce their matrix. Uh, if that happens, you either messed up in your row operations or your eigenvalues are incorrect, okay? All right, so there's a little tip there. Uh, now, this point's not super important, but you may as well do half row one. So you get it into the form one minus one and then zero, zero. So that's the reduced row echelon form. Okay. So what do we do after that? Well, to find the null space, we now want to convert this into a system of equations. So the first row gives us the equation like one X minus one Y. And then we set it equal zero because we're looking for the null space. Uh, other equation is just 0 equals 0, so it doesn't matter, OK? Now, if you remember, what we usually do is uh, we identify which variables we want to be free. So the usual convention was whatever column is missing a pivot will correspond to the variable that will be free. So here, the second column is missing a pivot. So therefore, I'm going to choose y, the second variable, to be free. So let's do y equals t. And then solving for x, we see that x is equal to t as well. So then the null space of this matrix is all multiples of the vector 1, 1. So then, in other words, the eigenvectors of A corresponding to the eigenvalue of 3 are all the uh, multiples of the vector 1, 1. Uh, maybe a slight caveat that should be non-zero because 
if you remember from the definition, um, the eigenvector must be non-zero, okay? Uh, but I feel like that's not like super important most of the times. Okay. Uh, most of the times you you don't need all the you don't need the entire eigenspace. Most of the times you only need a basis for each of the eigenspaces. So like here, for instance, in applications, you'd probably only care about uh, the vector one one uh, that you get here, rather than like all of its multiples as well. All right. But uh, we found all the eigenvectors corresponding to lambda equals three. So next we have the eigenvalue of negative one. So we also need to do the same thing. And so we need to find the null space of uh, lambda i minus a, okay? All right, so first to get this matrix, we can go back to lambda i minus a, and then just plug in negative one for lambda. So this time it's gonna be negative two uh, everywhere. All right. And so again, if we wanna find the null space of this matrix, um, go ahead and, you know, get the row echelon form or the reduced row echelon form. Uh, so I think here it's pretty clear that the reduced row echelon form would be 1100. Zero, zero. So now let's convert this into a system of equations. So this row gives us the equation 1x plus 1y uh, equals 0 for the null space. And we'll choose y to be the free variable once again. So let's say y is equal to t. Then x will be negative t. So from that, we see that the uh, null space is all multiples of the vector negative one, one. So then the uh, eigenvectors of matrix A Uh, corresponding to the eigenvalue of negative one are going to be the non-zero multiples of the specter. Okay. And then with that, that would have been all of the eigenvalues and all of the eigenvectors uh, of the matrix A that we had, okay? So I'll go ahead and pause and I'll just ask if anyone had any questions about any of that. All right, so now let's do some three by three examples. So those will be a little bit longer and more involved. All right. So next, let's look at the matrix A equals uh, one, one, negative one, uh, two, zero, negative one, 
2, negative 2, and 1. So let's start by finding the uh, eigenvalues. So we need the determinant of lambda i minus a. Okay. Okay, so remember that lambda i gives us lambdas on the diagonal. So when we do lambda i minus a, we're going to get lambda minus 1, lambda minus 0, and lambda minus 1 along the diagonal. And then since I am doing minus a, uh, I do end up having to negate the remaining entries because we're going to have like a 0 minus uh, each of these entries for the rest of the matrix. So here I'm just going to change the sign of the remaining entries on A. OK. And then here we do need the 3 by 3 determinant. So I'm going to compute it just by doing uh, cofactor expansion along the first row, OK? OK, so uh, that's going to give us lambda minus 1 times, and then cross out row and column. For the determinant, we're going to get lambda squared minus lambda. And then minus 2. OK. Next is going to be minus negative 1, so just plus. Then cross out the row and the column. So we're going to get neck 2 lambda plus 2 plus another 2 for a total of plus 4. And then we're going to get plus 1, and then times, cross out the row and the column, uh, negative 4 plus 2 lambda. OK. And so sometimes this might be a little bit complicated, uh, but here it works out very nicely. So notice that these two terms are opposites of each other, so they're actually just going to cancel out. And then we can actually factor this guy here. So if we factor it, it's going to be, let's see here, lambda minus 2 and lambda plus 1, OK? And with that, we're going to set it equal to 0. So solving for lambda, our eigenvalues are 1, 2, and negative 1. OK, so next, we need all of the eigenvectors. <clears throat> so let me start with the eigenvalue of 2. So let's look at the matrix 2i minus a. So we plug in 2 for lambda up here. We're going to get 1, 2, 1. And so let's do some row operations to reduce this matrix a bit uh, to find the null space. 
So first, uh, row three minus row two immediately gives us um, matrix of zeros, which remember we expect to happen. Uh, whenever we're finding eigenvectors, you should always get at least one row of zeros. Let's also do row two plus two row one. Next. So that will give us a zero, zero and three. And um, <clears throat> I guess we could go ahead and stop here. Uh, that looks simple enough. So let's write out the corresponding equations that we get. So the first row gives us one uh, X minus one Y plus one Z. Uh, we set it equal to zero for the null space. And then this is a uh, three Z is zero. So therefore Z is zero. We know that right now. Now, uh, we had pivots in the first and third column. The second column is missing a pivot. So let's make y a free variable. And if y is equal to t and z is equal to 0, then x will be equal to t as well. So then we have like all multiples of the vector 1, 1, 0 for the eigenspace, all right? And then uh, 1, 1, 0 is one particular eigenvector corresponding to lambda equals 2. And so usually just having one eigenvector is good enough for applications. So there's that. Let's do lambda equals 1 next. So we plug in one for lambda. It's going to be zero, one, zero along the diagonal. And here are the remaining entries. I'm just going to copy from here. And then again, we do need to do some real operations to find the null space of this matrix. So I guess here it's a little bit more complicated. Let's take row three. I'm gonna divide row three by negative one half. And then after that, we're gonna swap row one and row three. So this will become 1, negative 1, 0. And then we're going to swap it up to the top. So next, let's do row 2 plus 2, row 1. All right, great. And row three minus row two gives us the row of zeros, which again, we should always see when we're finding the eigenvectors. Um, it's not a big deal, but let me make this positive one and this negative one. So multiplying row two by negative one. And then if I did do row one plus row two to eliminate this negative one, just to put it into the reduced row echelon form. Again, not entirely necessary, but I just uh, feel like doing it right now. So that's what I'm going to do. OK. So with this reduced row echelon form, I'm going to write out the corresponding system of equations. Uh, 
And third column is missing the pivot. So that means the Z will be free. And then here we see that X and Y will also be equal to T as well. So all multiples of the vector one, one, one gives us the eigenspace uh, corresponding to the eigenvalue of one. And finally, the last eigenvalue that we had was negative one. So we're going to do negative one i minus a. So plugging in negative one for lambda will give us negative two, negative one, negative two. And then here are going to be the remaining entries. Uh, and again, we're going to do some raw operations. So I think this time, let's start with, I guess, kind of the same thing, negative 1 half row 3 to make this a positive 1. And then we'll move it to the first row after that. OK. So that's going to become 1, negative 1, 1 from this. And then we're going to swap it up to the top. Ah, and I guess we could also do row 3 minus row 2 after that. So let's just make that all zeros right now. OK. Uh, next, we can do row 2 plus 2 row 1. OK. And then I guess let's follow that up with negative 1 third row 2 to make that 1 and negative 1. And then we may as well do row 1 plus row 2. And I think this would be the reduced row echelon form. All right. So with that, uh, we get in the first row, we get the equation 1x equals 0. The second row gives us uh, y minus z is 0. And our third column is missing a pivot. So we'll make z the free variable. Then y will be t, x will be 0. So all multiples of the vector 0, 1, 1. That gives us the eigenspace corresponding to lambda equals negative 1. OK? All right, so any questions about all of that? OK. All right, now let's see here. I'll make a couple comments before I do at least one more example. Uh, OK, so if. Uh, if you are going to do determinant of uh, a minus lambda i, instead of lambda i minus a, uh, it's really not a big deal. For a 3 by 3 matrix, uh, you're just going to get the div of what i ended up getting. So like it has no effect on your 
uh, eigenvalues in the end. Okay. Uh, the reason why I don't like this as much as I do this though is because uh, I guess like sometimes your problem is more complicated, so it doesn't like factor right away like how mine did. So sometimes you have to like foil things out. And when you foil things out, you're gonna get like negative lambda cubed for like the first term. And I just don't like having like a negative in front of that like highest power term, especially when I'm trying to factor it. I just like would factor it out anyways. So uh, that, that's the reason why I just have a personal preference for doing this instead. Okay, uh, let me state one fact before I do another example. Okay, so the fact that I wanna state, uh, it's a very useful fact to know is that uh, eigenvectors uh, corresponding to uh, distinct eigenvalues are going to be linearly independent, okay? So this is a useful fact to know. So like as an example, Uh, if we look at the vectors 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 0, 1, 1. So the three of them, they were eigenvectors corresponding to different or distinct eigenvalues. So because of that fact, they are going to be uh, independent of each other, okay? All right. But now uh, I wanna do some other examples, at least one more. Um, okay, so let me do this one. Okay, let's take a look at this example next. <clears throat> and give me a second, I need to turn on the light because it's gotten really dark. All right. So we're gonna do the same thing, find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now, something kind of interesting is gonna happen this time, so Let's see what that interesting thing is. So again, we're going to start with the determinant of lambda i <clears throat> minus a. So that's going to give me lambda minus 1 across the diagonal. And then since we're doing minus a, that does end up changing the sign of the remaining entries. And then we need the determinant of this three by three matrix. So let's do cofactor expansion along that first row. So I'm gonna have lambda minus one times, oh, okay, lambda minus one squared. Mm, okay, let me go ahead and foil that out. So lambda squared 
minus two lambda plus one. So we'll get plus one and then we're gonna minus one. So they'll cancel out. And then next we're gonna have minus and so minus a negative one. So it'll be plus. Then we're just gonna get lambda minus one. Cool. Okay, so if so what I can do here is factor out a lambda minus one from both of these terms. That will leave me with lambda squared minus two lambda plus one. Uh, hmm. Okay, that's not quite what I wanted to happen, but I guess that's okay. It gives me lambda minus one cubed, which is still okay, all right? I think it'll still illustrate what I wanted. Okay, so uh, this is interesting because we only have one distinct eigenvalue this time, lambda equals one. Uh, here, let me just maybe introduce some more terminology just in case you come across it. Uh, some people might say that the uh, algebraic multiplicity of this eigenvalue is three. So if you see that phrase algebraic multiplicity uh, referring to an eigenvalue, uh, that's referring to like its multiplicity, like as a root of the characteristic polynomial, okay? Okay, well, we only have one eigenvalue, so that makes finding the eigenvectors quicker because there's only one matrix that we'll need to find the null space of. So we're just gonna do one I minus A. So we'll plug in one for all the lambdas here. So that'll be zero, zero, zero. Um, <clears throat> And here it's not much to do for the row operations. Uh, row three minus row one gives us a row zeros. And then not a big deal, but let's just swap row one and row two after that. Uh, okay, that's good enough. So that gives us, let's see here, x minus z is zero and uh, negative y is zero, so just y is zero, okay. So let's see here, let's make z the free variable. So we have z is t, y is zero, and then x is t. So then the eigenspace for the eigenvalue of one that we found is the span of the vector one, zero, one. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so in this case, we see that the eigenspace was uh, one dimensional because it's spanned by just a single vector. So I'm gonna introduce a little bit more terminology. So you might come across it, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think your class uses it much, but you might have done it kind of in passing, but the geometric multiplicity. Uh, 
of an eigenvalue. So the geometric multiplicity refers to the dimension of the corresponding uh, eigenspace. So since here the eigenspace was one dimensional, that means that the geometric multiplicity would have been one. Okay. So that's just kind of, um, I'll just maybe like put it in parentheses as an aside, just to sort of contrast with the algebraic multiplicity having been equal to three. Okay. So in a sense, this is kind of, uh, when this happens, um, this is bad, if you will, okay? So for an n by n matrix, you want to be able to find n linearly independent eigenvectors. Uh, that's the good scenario. If you're not able to find n uh, linearly independent eigenvectors, that's usually uh, frowned upon. And we'll see a little bit more about why that's the case uh, next week. So th this is kind of bad right now that we only found like one independent eigenvector for my three by three matrix. Okay. Uh, it's about out of time, but I would like to go ahead and squeeze in one final example. Oh, um, yeah, so it is possible to encounter imaginary numbers because, uh, of course, when you're finding the roots of a polynomial, they might be complex. Uh, I, I seem to recall that uh, in this class, they don't really do much with uh, complex eigenvalues, at least not anymore. They actually used to, though. Uh, but I think uh, I'm not going to uh, consider that, uh, at least in my reviews, because uh, I think most recently in the past couple of semesters, you haven't had to worry about that. Well, it's a little bit of shame though, it's kind of fun, but okay. Uh, I would like to do one final example. Okay, so let's find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for this three by three matrix. Okay, so we're again gonna do the determinant of lambda i minus a. So on the diagonal, that will give us lambda minus negative two, lambda minus zero, lambda minus two. And since I'm doing the minus a, I change the sign of everything else. I'm doing cofactor expansion along the first row. So lambda plus two times lambda squared minus two lambda minus three. Next will be minus a negative one, so plus. We'll cross these out. Be lambda minus two plus three, so lambda plus one altogether. Then we're gonna have plus negative one times negative three minus three lambda. Okay. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna factor negative three out from this term here. Which will leave us with uh, lambda plus one 
And since you factored out a negative three, it becomes plus three out here. Okay, so then we actually have plus four times lambda plus one if I add these together now. Over here, uh, this quadratic, I can actually factor as lambda minus three and lambda plus one. So then I can actually factor a lambda plus one out from these two terms that are being added. So if I factor out the lambda plus one, so we have this plus four over here. And then we're gonna get lambda plus two times lambda minus three, which I'm gonna go ahead and refoil back out. So lambda squared minus lambda and then minus six. And minus six plus four will be minus two. And then I can factor that as lambda plus one. And this will be lambda minus two times another lambda plus one. So lambda plus one squared, okay? So we have two eigenvalues, lambda equals two with algebraic multiplicity one, and then lambda equals negative one with an algebraic multiplicity of two, okay? Let's quickly find the eigenspaces. Starting with, uh, let's start with lambda equals two. So we're gonna plug in two for lambda. So before two, zero. And let's do some real operations to find the null space. Let's start with one third of row three. And then we'll swap with row one. Uh, we'll do row two minus row one and row three minus four row one. Uh, did I do that right? Ah, oh, row two minus row one should be three. Okay, good. Uh, because we know that we should get a row zeros uh, when we do these row operations. So let's just go ahead and make it zero. Okay. <clears throat> oh, 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 geez. Whoa, okay. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and stop here. Let's write out our equations. So x minus y must be zero. And then three y minus z uh, must be zero as well. <clears throat> okay. So the third column is missing a pivot. So convention says we should make z our free variable. Uh, I'm going to go up and go against that convention this time because uh, it looks nicer if we make y equal to t because then we can say that z is 3t 
and then x would be t, and that looks a bit nicer. Okay, so the eigenspace corresponding to lambda equals two would be all multiples of the vector one, one, three. Uh, but now I really want to examine the lambda equals negative one, which uh, just kind of like in the previous example, it's a repeated eigenvalue here. So let's see what happens for this guy. Okay, so let's plug negative one into this matrix for lambda. So we'll get one minus one and minus three. Okay, so very nice. Let's do some real operations. All right, great. So here we get one equation, x minus y minus z is zero. And this time we have two free variables because we have two pivots, or well, two pivots that are missing. So let's maybe do like y is s and z is t. So x would be s plus t. So then the eigenspace is, let's do s times one, one, zero, plus t times one, zero, one. Running in r. And so this gives us the uh, eigenspace corresponding to lambda is negative one. <clears throat> so notice that when you have an eigenvalue, which was uh, a repeated root of the characteristic polynomial, it is possible that its eigenspace will be uh, higher dimensional. So in the last example, that was not the case, but in this example, it is the case that we had a higher dimensional eigenspace. So here the geometric multiplicity of lambda equals negative one happens to equal two because the eigenspace is two dimensional. And even though we only had two distinct eigenvalues, we still managed to find three uh, independent eigenvectors. Uh, so this is actually still um, considered uh, good, okay? Uh, so we'll, we'll talk more about uh, everything else um, next week. But that will be all for today.